And so thanks for coming and um, welcome to those of you that are on Zoom. Um, just a little note, tomorrow we are having our Celebrate Snow Rice Creek Winter Festival. It was supposed to be today, but we had to move it because of snow, actually because of wind. <laughs> so um, hope to see a lot of you tomorrow from 12 to two. Um, we have all kinds of fun things planned for you. So I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Michael Perez. He's from um, RIT and he is in the School of Photographic Arts and Sciences. And if you saw our signs that were delivered all over campus and around downtown and so forth, you'll see that he has um, an interest in snowflakes that started when one of his students introduced him to Snowflake Bentley, is that correct? Yes. And I was telling him that I've heard of Snowflake Bentley from being an elementary teacher. So um, that got him into it and he's going to show us today what it is he does with these snowflakes and his beautiful photographs. And hopefully we'll all walk away having a little better idea how to maybe attempt some ourselves. So. Don't do it. <laughs> it's maddening. So thank you very much. And thank you for braving the weather as well. So. Thank you, Laurel. Yep. It's, I'm going to take off the mask. Is that okay? Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. It was a little adventure to get here this morning. And I got a call from Kristen saying, are you going to be able to get here with this weather and the wind? And uh, it was a whiteout in Rochester for a, a little while this morning. It wasn't much snow. We had uh, a lot of snow recently, but not so much. But the wind was really terrible. So thank you for being here. And I'll share a little bit about my snowflake story with you. Um, I wasn't sure what to title it every time I give this talk, which is often in the winter. Nobody wants to talk about them in July or August. It's sort of a, a winter kind of thing. Uh, so I talk, thought it'd be fun to talk really about the best snowflakes, trying to get to the best snowflakes, because we get a lot of snow uh, in this part of the country, but not all of it is really very pretty. Not all of it is something we like to photograph. So for me, this was sort of a, it's been a discovery of random accidents and good fortune and a lot of fun and a lot of failures getting to this point because I truthfully didn't really know much about snowflake photography. Uh, I was a biomedical photographer. I'm a board certified medical photographer. I teach biomedical photography, working with specimens and microscopes, but per prepared samples. I work with things that are stuck between glass with stains and easy to work with in climate conditions. And uh, I'm in charge. I don't really have the dynamic nature of the weather to contend with. Um, I will tell you everything that I'll share is sort of self-taught. I'm not a meteorologist, uh, I'm not a physicist. So I figured things out by reading the, the newspaper and watching the weather and then going out and watching the snow, watching the snow and, and uh, what happens, what happens when I'm out there. And then I, I teach with a professor, Ted Kinsman, who's also a snowflake photographer. So two of us in one building is a lot. Uh, we share stories, but Ted showed me some really important tricks really from the beginning, which has laid the groundwork for what I'll share with you a little bit. So it, uh, there's no expertise here. It's just trial by error and making tons of mistakes and working through them and figuring out how to get it to work better. So this is my daughter. To give you some sense of scale timeline, you know, she was, I don't know, a sophomore in high school and she got interested in helping me collect them because, you know, you need to have a lot of hand dexterity to pick up these little tiny things there. You know, if you hold your fingers apart about a millimeter, just so you see light, that's about how small the crystals are that I like to photograph. Sometimes you can see them when you're out, but those crystals often aren't really very they have all kinds of stuff going on to make them easy to see. <laughs> They're huge for one, but they also uh, get some rhyme. So Leah, you know, she was interested in this and then it became part of her dental application story. Oh, I helped my dad with snowflakes. I like details. And so the interviewers were very interested in her story. And I have a neighbor who teaches in the elementary school. And so he buys a little snowflake book that I wrote and I go talk to the kids and it's just been delightful what happens. And just the other day, I got a little note. So I'm the man, I'm the man. And there's the microscope and there's the crystals. So it's really great to work with young people, you know, and, and they keep it interesting for me because they get so much joy out of the story and because, you know, they're, you know, open their eyes to something they've never seen. So I'm interested in the kind of best crystals that I could possibly catch. You know, I, I don't want to take pictures of what looks like table salt or styrofoam or any other kind of chipped ice that comes out of your refrigerator. I'm looking for really 
special crystals. And surprisingly, they don't come as frequently as we might like. So I grew up a couple of hours east of here. So I'm familiar with winter. I live on the lake like you do. And the lake can be, you know, very forgiving and also very makes a lot of weather for Rochester. And this time of year, you know, the evaporate, the lake is not frozen right now, as you well know. Erie is, but Ontario isn't. So there's a lot of evaporation. And then immediately it turns to ice and snow and falls. So I watched the weather beginning in November. It's kind of like what happens when you're obsessed with something. You watch the weather and you watch the weather and you're all eager for the first snowflakes to sort of appear in the season. And, uh, you know, this kind of a snow isn't the kind of snow that I'd photograph it. I could tell you just knowing the volume of snow here, it's not going to be have good flakes in it. In the beginning of the storm or the tail end of the storm sometimes, but during the middle of the storm, it's just snowing like mad an inch an hour and there's not really the kind of crystals that you'd imagine would be in the storm. Mostly granular, which I'll sh share with you what it looks like. And I, my dogs are my snowflake hunters. They help me there because I'm in and out of the house. You know, I go in and out, in and out, in and out, because I have to do this outside. I can't bring the snowflakes in the house. I got to be outside. Um, so I'm outside and we get approximate. Well, to season, we've only had 65 inches, but that's exactly where we should be about this time of year. We were really low. December, we were down seven or eight inches for Rochester, which was like, wow, this is going to be a really unusual winter. But January, it snowed 25 straight days, probably like here too. It didn't stop snowing and it was below zero many days. And when it's that cold, it's not very good for snowflake photography. It's almost like looking at Johnson and Johnson's baby powder. That's how fine and, and uh, tiny the crystals start to be. So this is my very first snowflake picture taken in 2003. And I think by rough, est rough estimation, I'm up to about 1,100. Snowflake Bentley, which someone mentioned a few minutes ago, has about had uh, made about 5,000 pictures in his lifetime. So I've been at this 20 years. Bentley was at this about 50 years. So I, I think I, I'll never get as much as he did. But um, he lived in Jericho, Vermont, and the, the conditions were much better in Vermont than they are in Rochester, especially during the period right now where our temperatures are changing and our winters are changing. So I'm a little obsessed and my students know I'm a little obsessed. So they make these little gifts of me. They like to make fun of my fascination with snowflake photography. And I get texts from friends all the time. The snowflakes are good down here in Canandaigua. How about by you? Maybe you wanna get out. So I have like a whole system now of people helping me um, to make these kind of pictures. But this is Emily. And she went to see an exhibition of uh, Wilson Bentley's uh, collection at the Buffalo Museum and Science Center. When Bentley died, the Smithsonian took 500 of his 5,000 pictures, and then his daughter had to clean out his estate, which was 4,500 negatives and glass plate and pictures. And so the Buffalo Museum and Science Center bought all of it for pennies. And so it's all there. And once a year, of course, in winter, not July, not August, not September, but sometime in November or December, they have an exhibition, not in totality of Bentley stuff. She saw the exhibition and came back and she was super excited to try it. I hadn't any clue what it would be like. And uh, so this is Wilson Bentley. And, and so his methods have become my methods just because they're practical. What he did before the internet, before electricity, before running water, uh, using even making his own film in the very beginning of his career in the late 1890s. Uh, he would catch them on that little tray and then he'd make pictures. And he was way more obsessed than I was. And he kept really detailed journals. I can't read them. They're terribly, they're small, they're itty bitty. They got water drops. But this is from 1903 to 1910. Every single day, every winter, every photograph he made, the weather conditions, the temperature, the type of crystals, all of it, fascinating. Fascinating guy. And these are his glass plate negatives. I was able to go uh, to the collection in the Buffalo Museum and Science Center and handle them with the curator's permission. Um, just beautiful, beautiful. And then just this week, I got a text from a friend of mine. People know I'm interested in this. So you get texts and you get emails. This came from Ted Kinsman again. I learned about this guy, Gustav Hellman. And he wrote a little story in 1897 about his snowflake photography. But then I later learned that he accused Bentley of not making science pictures, but 
making fraudulent pictures because he manipulated them. He scratched the negatives and he changed the crystal pictures to make them perfect. And he got rid of all the particular matter with razor blades and scratching. So Hellman didn't think his pictures were truthful or science. So the beginnings of ethics in science photography started way back between these two snowflake photographers, one in Germany and one in the US. And uh, I just learned about this guy this week. So there's always so much more we can learn. So in November, I'm all excited. It's kind of like, you know, a baseball fan or something. You're ready for the season to begin because you've been through the hot and the raking of the leaves and you're done with that already. And you, you know, so you're ready for winter. And I kind of think about snowflake photography, much like being a fisherman, because, you know, there's fishing and then there's catching. And sometimes you go home just with some memories, but nothing, or other times, you know, you get something good. So it's a process. It's that adrenaline, that excitement for the unknown and what will happen or what won't happen. So that's, that's half of it for me, the excitement of trying, you know, that I can, I can, I can get skunked often. I go out and the forecast is the right temperature. Maybe the storm's going to be kind of light, but the temperature's good. The humidity's good and nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever. So these are the kind of the problems. The season's kind of short, all things considered. So to be a snowflake photographer, you're gonna work maybe from November to April, maybe November to March, maybe some of that, maybe none of that. You know, we get the January thaw, we get all kinds of things. It has to snow for me to photograph snow crystals, right? I mean, obviously, but it should be stated. You know, if it's not snowing, I can't photograph. The snow has to be the right kind of snow because often, you know, if 100 inches of snow, only maybe 10% of the storms have good crystals in them. One out of every 10 storms has good crystals, at least in Rochester. I'm assuming the weather conditions are pretty similar here. People, if they lived in Colorado or up in Jericho, Vermont, in the Green Mountains, they have a different kind of snow, a different kind of weather, a different altitude, different humidity. The lake changes the kind of crystals that we get by a factor of a lot. For me to photograph, because I work in my garage, it has to be about 28 degrees or colder. If I didn't work in my garage, if I worked in a shed or worked somewhere off site, not physically attached to my house, which there's a microclimate in the garage, because we'd like our houses to be perfectly sealed from the winter weather, but there's always some leakage. So the temperature in my garage is never really what the outside temperature is. So if it's 32 outside and I catch a crystal and I bring it in the garage, it's a water drop. So I can't photograph. I have to be available to photograph when it's snowing and it's the right temperature. So if I'm sleeping or if I'm teaching or if I'm driving, I can't photograph. Um, the crystals I have to catch when they're falling in the air. If I let the snowflakes fall and they interact with other crystals, sometimes if it's high humidity, they stick. They almost become welded together. Um, or they interact with other kinds of moisture sources because they're like sponges. They're looking for moisture. The crystal is just trying to get more moisture. That's its job to grow and gather moisture. So any opportunity it has to do that, it does. So the most pristine crystals I catch before they interact with other crystals. And I'll show you how I do that. Then I have to isolate it. So I need to get it in my microscope somehow and make it a singular structure. Then I light it. I use a special fiber optic light, much like a jeweler would try to make the facets of a gemstone twinkle. I like to make my crystals twinkle. I like to see the facets and the internal structures and the topography of them. And while I'm working, things could be happening. And I'll talk a little bit about the fact that the crystals are not stable. They either will melt or they will evaporate right underneath my lens, they'll disappear. So you can begin to see it's just a lot of chaos, a lot of random components go into this for me. And these guys want to be outside with me. This is my new one. He's impossible because he's 85 pounds and he just wants to be, he's barking from the inside of the house because he hears me in the garage and it's not very relaxing right now. I got to teach him to calm Otis calm. <laughs> So this is my snowflake garage shack kind of looks like probably all of your garages it's full of stuff but a little closer examination I have two microscopes that I use. And these are my filters newspapers and the newspaper delivery bag, and then this is my light source I use a little bifurcated fiber optic light source with the tungsten halogen bulb and then my microscope sits here with my little focusing stage. So it's kind of cobbled together from used pieces and parts of discard. Universities are always full of stuff that doesn't get used anymore. 
And this stand is very stable and the magnification that I'm trying to photograph work with, it works just really well. So in November, I'm out looking. I use a little black velvet piece of cloth on a baking tray. Uh, velvet is a perfect material for this because it has no nap. So if you were to use your sweater or a piece of black felt, for example, and the crystal fell in it, the crystal would get merged with the fibers in the felt. And then you'd try to pick it up and they break. So you can't photograph or move them once they're on that black fabric. But vel velvet's kind of like human hair. It's just fibers, it's straight. It doesn't have any nap. So I can put my needle that I use to move my snowflake and pick it up with some static electricity. So I'm out. My neighbors probably think I'm a kook, you know, in and out, in and out. What's he doing? He's in and out. But now, by now, they know, but in and out. And so I'm looking, I'm just watching. It doesn't have to snow, big snow, for me to get the best crystals. In fact, sometimes when you can't hardly see snowflakes, that's when they're the best crystals. When they're clear, that's the best snowflakes. If you can see them, they're probably on the cusp of not being clear because they've, the moisture is growing on the surface of that crystal. So it snows. This isn't good snow at all. I could tell you that because it's very humid and those are huge clumps. And there could be 500 crystals in that clump. That's why it's so easy to see them. See, nothing, no crystals, just kind of granular snow, nondescript, looks like chipped ice and all. I go out every time it's snowing. It's nuts. I'm telling you, do not do this because if you like it, it's going to drive you crazy. This is just like table salt snow. Nothing, not a single crystal, but you have to go out and look at it to know that. You can't see that on the weather report or look on your iPhone to see what the forecast is. You have to actually go look at the, see what's falling because sometimes you're surprised. Now these are kind of beginning to be good crystals, but because they're totally white, they're not clear. They have something and I'll talk more about it. It's called rime, it's freezer burn. It's like shaving cream on the surface of the crystal. It grows frost on it, so it's no longer transparent. More rimy snowflakes. So we get a lot of rimy snowflakes because we have a lot of humidity because we're next to the lake. So this might be the sixth or seventh or eighth storm of the year. And I still really, I mean, I'm embellishing a little bit, but the truth of the matter is this is how frustrating it is when I want to photograph. Even Otis is trying to find one. More table salt. So, I mean, we get snow, we just get a lot of it, but it's nothing. It's snowing. Nothing. And it's too warm. You know, November's terrible because it's so frustrating. I'm trying to photograph and it's 31 degrees and it's all this kind of snowflakes. So, we get styrofoam looking snow, right? You've all seen this. You live here. You know what I'm talking about. You probably never looked at it, but every once in a while, see my, my catch tray now. There's some clear flakes. So you can see these are more clear than these. This one's very clear. These are clear. So I'm looking for flakes that are more clear. I don't want to see a white flake in the tray. I'm looking for a clear flake in the tray. So all the time, day, night, morning, five o'clock in the morning, I take the dogs for their first walk. And it's like, oh, I got it. You guys go in here. So this is the kind of snow where you get those kind of crystals. It's not a lot of snow. It's just kind of light. And you got to go and you look and you go and you look. And then you go and you look. <laughs> it's a process. And then these, can you see these crystals are not white? These crystals are not white. They're transparent. They're really clear. Uh, and so they're, they're kind of really nice. But they have no snowflake is out without flaws. You know, the things you see that sometimes are too perfect, the things we can do with computers in the arts is astonishing. I, I like to maintain the imperfections a little bit because it legitimizes the picture. It's real, like I have pimples and warts and moles. Snowflakes have pimples and warts and moles. So I, I try not to make them too perfect. So once I found them, I'm working in the garage. I'm trying to be quick because things are happening. I find a snowflake that I want to use. And I use a little needle taped to a pencil and I put that needle and I draw it across my finger once or twice to put a little static charge on it. Because the snowflake will be attracted to the electricity because it has a static charge already because it grew in a magnetic field. And I pick it up so it sticks to my needle from the static electricity and I can move it to the slide and now the trick is to get it off of the needle and not break it. 
<laughs> so I had to learn how to roll it without breaking it because they're very delicate. You know, they're not very durable. And if I drop it, they're gone. If I breathe on it, it melts or blows away. So I have to be sort of cognizant of all of the things that can happen. I put it on my stage of my microscope, which is a discarded astro telescope focusing stage. And I use a beautiful Zeiss lens. These lenses are no longer made, but this was a, a really beautiful lens called a luminar. So I'm using, it's a kind of a macro camera rather than a microscope. I could use a 2x magnification on a microscope. Um, my snowflakes are approximately a millimeter in size, the ones that I, I seem to end up photographing the most. And I light from below. I don't light from above. A lot of snowflake photographers that I follow on Instagram light from above with a ring light. I like to light from below with, a, with uh, the fiber optic light. I have to work quickly, so I stop kind of breathing while I'm focusing, looking through the camera to get my pictures. And when everything works right, you can make these kind of pictures. So this crystal is transparent. It doesn't have really any flaws. There's no water droplets. There's no rime. And so the way that I light, I make the shadows. I make the bright spots. I make the highlights so that we can see the topography and the facets and the crystals themselves. In November, when I start working, this is what I get. Oh, I'm all excited. I catch a crystal, I run in the house and it's uh, to the garage microscope and they melt and they melt and right before the lens. So I can't even get one frame off before they're, they're liquid. This one looks like a little dancer. So then I started to make time lapses of them melting because what else am I gonna do? <laughs> keep, it, keep it a little interesting. I think there's 53 pictures in this, just click, 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 click. And then, you know, 45 seconds later, it's a drop of water. So temperature plays a role. I gotta be awake when I, oh, things have to come in to, to be, uh, to make these pictures. But then, you know, there's this stuff called granular snow, which is about 90% of the snow we get in Rochester, probably is similar here. Uh, and probably this is granular snow. It, it doesn't really have much. It's just kind of like you can see shards of snowflakes. Whoops, excuse me. Uh, oh, how did we bring this over here? So we can see the shards of flakes and broken stuff. So they're not really pristine crystals. Whoops. It's behaving in the way it likes. So it kind of is nondescript. This is the velvet. So just a lot of just grunge, <laughs> snow, ice crystals, nothing of any descript. These are called capped columns. These are really tiny. Uh, you I work with about a 20x microscope objective to make these pictures. So. This is the structure and then there's a hexagonal plate that forms on each end and sometimes they join together in little columns. I'm always, even after 20 years of doing this, fascinated with how they are so different and unique. So this is kind of how that capped column. So this is on the end of the capped column called a hexagonal plate. And then it has these little columns going on in the tubes. I mean, think about the physics of how those water drops formed and became an ice crystal and then grew that way. I mean, you know, many probably remember Play-Doh and the little Play-Doh molds. I mean, there's some kind of Play-Doh mold up there that's making these things so special. These are called columns and they're hollow. You can see in these hot columns. So these are, these are not needle snow. They're little tiny columns, almost like straws. They're not very interesting. They all look like that, but they can pile up a lot of snow quickly uh, when it's like this. And this is called needle snow. Have you ever been out and it's windy and it hits your face and it hurts? See the needles? <laughs> now you know why, because they're sharp. Um, when they stick you, they're just like ice driving. So this is needle snow and it's got its own little topography and its own sort of aesthetic. And then this is a capped column with rime growing on it. So it's got freezer burn and frost growing on the capped column. I had never seen the capped columns grow with frost around them. So this was kind of interesting and not very pretty to me, but I, because I'm photographing all winter long, I photograph what I get just to have representative examples for a talk like this or talking to kids about what's out there. And then there's this thing called sublimation. So we'll do a little physics here when, you know, water can become a solid or a gas or a liquid. 
And when it goes from a solid straight to a gas, it's called sublimation. And so when I'm photographing, this photograph was made at 1023. This photograph was made at 1024. Within 60 seconds, maybe 20% of the crystal is gone. It just goes, evaporates right away. So like the clock is ticking when I'm photographing. The clock is ticking, so I'm focusing and lighting and working, and then it's, it disappears. It disappears right before my camera lens. Look at this. All of the little wings that were on that dendritic crystal in, in, a, in a minute are gone. So the timer is always running when I'm photographing. Even though I've caught it and I've isolated and I've lit it and I'm getting something, I hope, uh, it could be disappearing while I'm working. Uh, so uh, I watch it just kind of disappear. I, it sounds kind of corny, but it's really interesting to me that I'm the only person that got to see that crystal in the whole world, that I catch these things and I photograph it and the photograph survives, but what I saw is gone. And I, you know, something about that is fascinating to me, that I got to see something no one in the whole world saw, even though everybody saw the snow, they didn't see that crystal. And so for me, that's one of those odd things I can't really describe. It seems peculiar that I'm inspired by that, but that's one of the things that keeps me going, that I get to see something no one else did in my photographs, share that experience. And that's much the same of the science work I do with physicists and biologists and chemists, because nobody sees often what goes on in the labs. So this is rhyme. That's why they look white when you see them. They got all this frost growing on the surface and they're not transparent. And so they're hidden, they're hidden. And the longer they stay in a humid altitude environment, they just wick the moisture like a sponge does and it grows water droplets like the shower. There's tons of humidity in the air and they just become covered in frost. So the patterns can be kind of anywhere. Now these are almost like somebody took a spray bottle and put water drops that grew on these crystals. So they're still kind of interesting to me. They almost look like pewter. They look like silver. They don't look like ice. They don't look like crystal. And this one has a little needle snow that was attached to it. The amount of focus that I can maintain, these crystals are probably five times magnified at my camera with the microscope that I use. It's very difficult to keep a millimeter in focus. I can't keep a millimeter in focus. That's how shallow my focus is. It's less than a millimeter. And so the crystals have topography. They're not flat. You would like them to be flat. You would hope that they are flat, but they're not. So there's a width and then there's an elevation to them. And so, and they don't lay flat ever. I tap them, I do things to try to get it to lay more flat, but they don't. So I'm okay with the shallow focus. You know, I think that the focal point is the middle of these types of crystals. And so um, if I did some types of camera secret sauce tricks, <laughs> I could increase the focus, but uh, I much prefer to have a zone of focus that lets the viewer find something to study. So this one's completely covered in this kind of frost. So they all, it's when you get those perfect crystals, that's really what I'm after. But, you know, I get what I get. I'm not in charge of that. That's the one thing I've learned about being photographing snowflakes is I'm not in charge of any of it. I get to kind of accept what I get and work with it to the extent that I can and make some pictures of it and enjoy them for that. And when it's this cold, when it's zero, you know, it looks, as I say, like table salt. But even within the table, uh, baby powder, there's these fascinating little structures within these little tiny crystals. I mean, they're hollow, almost like Native American Indian art within these little tiny, tiny structures. And so, you know, I become a snowflake snob. I'll be the first one to admit it. I have like a, an aesthetic about what I'm trying to photograph because, you know, I want good pictures. You know, I don't want to just photograph table salt. I'm interested in special. So this is called a stellar plate. All snowflakes start out in, with this basic structure. Without wings, they all start out in this hexagon. Hexagon, So they all have them. And these are tiny small. These are, these are smaller than almost the space you can see. These are not as large as some of the crystals I've shown you. These are more clear, but they're still very interesting. And they all have unique sort of patterns. This one started to collect water drops on the surface. This one reminded me of the Michelin tire man in there. 
I mean, think about the physics of how these form, you know, it's just crazy. All these unique structures. So this one has like a little, almost like a Ghostbusters or something kind of, and this one it even has much more structure and it's very symmetrical, right? You see these kind of braces that have come into this region and here we have all of this sort of structure to these crystals. This one doesn't have the hexagon, where did it go? How could that be? Like it's sort of inherent to a snow crystal. This one started to grow frost, but it has almost a six starred sided star in the middle of the hexagon. And, and as it grew and took on more moisture, it grew and grew and grew. Always with this hexagon in the middle. And these are starting to grow some wings a little bit. So they're starting to grow wings. And I'll talk a little bit about why I think that happens. And please, if there's any of you have any questions, you're also attentive and quiet, it's lovely. Uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions as we go. This is a casual conversation about my obsession. Let's think about it that way. I'm neurotic, I'll be the first one to admit uh, that. And this one had a little mutation, right? The hexagon looks really squished, something happened. It ran into another crystal when it was first formed. This one has some little mutation going on. so. They all truly are different in many ways. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people that probably travel around to support their hobbies, especially have you ever thought of doing a mobile thing in a trailer? Maybe. <laughs> no, you know, it's something I do just because it's winter and I'm home, I'm stuck at the house. So I think. Uh, there are people that travel. I know of a physicist in Caltech. His name is Kenneth Lebrecht. I'm going to show you some of his work. He's traveled to Alaska and Sweden and UK and Russia to photograph. But maybe in my future, I'm soon to retire, so it might be something. But no, what we're looking at is snowflakes of Rochester only. <laughs> I actually call them snowflakes of Rochester. What's the ideal temperature? 15 to 25. That sort of seems to be the sweet spot for the kind of crystals I'm looking for. So these are the dendritic crystals, they're called. So the stellar plates are the ones without wings. And then once they start to grow these fascinating structures because they've been in an environment where there's more time, more humidity, uh, magnetic fields that happen in the atmosphere help to move the water molecules in certain ways, they grow these wings. So these are called dendrites. And they're all unique and special too. This, this wing has started to melt. Can you see how it's soft and all of the details that are here have disappeared? So this one's starting to melt. It's, it may evaporate as well, but for the minute, this is what they start to look like when they melt. They get without definition, just like the water drop, it just gravity pulls it down and it loses all its structural definition. I love blue. I started out with reds and other colors, but you know, red is the hot, hot and the hot water dispenser in your kitchen. So snowflakes are not hot. Uh, so I, I've been working mostly with blues and then I've been playing around with no color whatsoever. But I'm always trying to create the illumination to share the topography and the facets and the little details within all of the crystals, the things like I was talking to you about these things and stuff that is unique to each crystal. And just with this kind of curiosity, how did that come to be? How did that come to be? And these are stuck together. So all these crystals are stuck together. Whether they melted and then froze together or there was a ton of humidity and they collected humidity and then they stuck together at that point, but there's no way to separate them at this point. They would break, they would just break. Look at what's going on in the end of this one. Just almost like Arabic writing. It's just fascinating how each of them has their own little special characteristics. So this one, there's two snowflakes here and they were filled with water droplets that had formed, but because the water drops are out of focus, it almost looked like hammered glass to me. You know, we had the bathroom glass that has all of the topography to it. So 
because the water drops are out of focus and on the bottom of one crystal, but there's another one stacked to it like a sandwich, uh, it created this sort of effect that I haven't seen before. So it's, there's a lot of lighting, you know, to be a good photographer. You know, photography is by definition writing with light. And so how I light becomes an important component of what I show, what you get to see, because I'm in charge of that. I get to play with the light and then I share what I think is important. And then you get to see what I thought was important. So there's nothing really objective with science photography. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> I get to focus, I get to compose, I get to select the objects that I put under my microscope. So we think science is objective, but it's not so much. We get a lot of our own skews that we add to our, our work. So lighting in the photographic practice is a big part of that. So, so here's my microscope. It's a bunch of old broken things. And I use all of these things. This is my favorite go-to. You know, some of you might still get a newspaper, not too many, but I don't know, does Oswego still have a newspaper? Yeah. Rochester's is kind of like in serious decline, but it, for those that get it, it gets, comes in a blue bag. And so that's my favorite for that's how I make blue. And I make orange and I make red. This is an orange juice top. <laughs> this is a Tostitos top. Uh, I use a broken piece of uh, pottery or glass, uh, different things to get different effects. So this is a crystal, actually two crystals. This is without any coloration. I call it optical staining, okay? Because that's what I'm doing. I'm staining the crystal optically with some filters. And then I play. So this crystal can look like this, or this crystal can look like this, or this crystal can look like this, right? Or this crystal could look like that. Just by changing the light a millimeter, moving the light a millimeter, or adding that blue bag, and, and moving, I have to move it. I wiggle the light to see what reflects and what twinkles, I like to call it the twinklies, <laughs> what I can get to twinkle in the crystals to get them to, and of course, everyone in the room would have a different favorite, like you'd all have a different, it's the same crystal, but it's getting smaller. See the tip right here, whoops, see this, watch what happens. So it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. During my experiment, the sublimation was occurring. So nine different views of one crystal with nine different ways of treating the crystal with different kinds of light all creates a completely different photograph of the crystal. I think this would be my, my favorite of the series because it's not too much color. I'm not a, I don't like so much color where the color is the photograph. I like the crystal to be the subject still. And it, it looks transparent. It looks almost silver-like which becomes another goal. So small changes make big changes. So every snowflake is really truly different as you've begun to see from the talk. And we know that from even elementary school when we were studying this. And it's because the temperature that these little crystals form at changes altitude to altitude where the H2O became uh, a molecule and then joined with other H2 molecules. And so we have this little covalent bond going on that makes this hexagon and then it starts growing. It needs a little speck of pollution for that to happen. And the humidity where it forms and then the magnetic field that's in the, at the atmosphere and then how long it travels. So let's pretend for a minute, this little process starts over Oswego right now. H2O molecule forms and it forms its little ring and then it starts to go up to Toronto. Let's go see what the Canadians are doing today. Uh, let's go to Buffalo. And then we blow to Detroit and then we blow back to Rochester and we fall to the ground. So every snowflake has a complete, it could go miles up into the atmosphere before it falls. You know, we don't know where it goes, where it started, how long it's up there. And that's what makes every crystal different because of all of those variables for each one of them. They're on a different path. Even though they're in one storm, they could have come from all different places before they sort of come together. In the storm clouds, they can blow from different places. So these variables make for the unique differences in all the crystals. We know this, you know, it's water molecule stuff and they're all start out kind of this way. I like the little ones sometimes, they're awfully cute. You know, they're unique. 
There's a lot of negative space. There's a lot of space around it. So there's things that I sometimes find in my photography. And this one was frozen with three different kinds of crystals all in one. It sort of spoke to this whole notion of they're all different because of the path that they take. And this one was completely all stuck together. And so you can see the topography and why shadows become important. The black spots are the shadows and that's how I can communicate the topography within the crystal. This one wasn't very transparent. Uh, it's water drops rhyme sort of I, I don't know how to dis differentiate those two phenomena but yes yep I think people that don't know like me that we would call this rhyme. <laughs> but if I spoke to Dr Lebrecht he would probably be able to give us a really technical explanation because his PhD is in snowflake formation. Fascinating guy I'm going to show you one of his projects this one feels sharp. This one feels dangerous. <laughs> So this is Dr. Lebrecht, he's traveling. He has his microscope in the back of his van. It's a homemade rig that he built. And so he works also, he's built a snowflake lab in his lab at Caltech. So he, he kind of cheats too. So he photographs out in the field, but he also grows designer snowflakes in his lab. And so he actually has made two snowflakes that are identical. And so you're gonna get to see his work. So he creates temperature, humidity, a magnetic field, and he dials it in as he wishes. And he grew two crystals simultaneously, and they are absolutely in every attribute the same. So this kind of dispels that, I guess, no two snowflakes are alike unless they're grown in a laboratory. <laughs> but I thought they were kind of pretty. So I, I shared Dr. Lebrex because I'm sure you've all heard no two crystals are alike. So I'm going to take a small little, we're going to listen to a little music, do a little multimedia and look at a few crystals for maybe 10 minutes and see how that goes. I hope you like Anya. <laughs> Thank you. 
What do you think? You like them? They're crazy. I can't believe I've been doing this for almost 20 years. I think I really am crazy. <laughs> but as you see feathers, you see feathers. Yeah, you know, you can project into these types of photographs without a sense of frame of reference, anything you might like to see. When you say there are no two pathways to light, you don't mean that. Of course not. Not absolutely. I mean, just think about how many are falling right now per minute. Billions, trillions, more than we can count. There's more snowflakes probably than sand grains on the beach in the wintertime. But they do have, just in my own 19 years of pictures, there's very few that, there's many similarities, but there's many that are, one wing is different than the others, or these other types of structures that seem to grow. I mean, look at this one and this one. It's, but within a storm, the kind of quality of the crystals is pretty similar. So when I photograph, I'll get the same kind of crystals in the same storm. So each storm has its own sort of personality. Are we doing for time, Kristen? 10 more minutes, perfect. So I have some favorites, I'll go quick to them. So we all have to have favorites, I think, you know, at least I have some favorites, maybe because they were difficult to make or it was like my epic snowflake catch. <laughs> uh, so these were kind of special. So, you know, um, when you go get gas in the filling station, it's rain, you can see the rainbows. Some of the crystals have this little interference pattern that occurs in them. Your video projector and my screen are pretty different as to be expected, and that, that one looks different than this one, um, which is very common as well. This one reminds me of a Swedish king's crown, you know. And I was able to just tickle it enough with the blue filter to get the outside of it to reflect the blue color, but not color the whole crystal. This one was even more special. But it has this little flaw in the middle. Well, it wasn't a crack, it was like a, like a waterfall, it just grew at a different elevation. This one I thought was very cute. It was a wee little tiny one. Yeah, yep. This was the slide that I had on the title slide. It's very pretty and it was growing vertically here on the edge of this crystal. There was wings that were growing north off of the east-west crystal. So they just sat next to each other on my microscope slide and I thought, well, they need to be together. Why move them? I couldn't get them both in the frame and I went that way. So I know we're gonna leave some time for questions. So we'll, we'll get through these. Mm -hmm. So these two were stuck together. They were a pair, they were married. I think there's a lot of, yeah, this one was my March 13th, 2013. I remember this date because it was a really, this is maybe my best crystal I've ever caught. This one's pretty special. It's really got a ton of detail and it hadn't melted and it was uh, really pretty, but I have another one too. Not this one. Although this one, I like the little ones, like stubbies. <laughs> this one has, you can see the vertical, but this is it. This was January 2nd, 2014. <laughs> yeah, this, this was, I got some really special crystals that day but I haven't seen anything quite like this one in a while. And then, you know, you get little mutant crystals all the time, little odd shaped things. I do. <laughs> yep, I just look, I just want to see. I don't want to miss one. <laughs> Keep my camera battery charged, camera ready, you know. My wife will tell you, 
the truth that, that it happens like that. So these kind of had weird morph formations. There was nothing structurally sort of symmetrical about them. This one had a, a stellar plate within a stellar plate. I hadn't seen that before. And this is, I don't believe this is really a 12 sided snowflake, but it really looks like a 12 sided snowflake. This is two crystals stuck together. I'm convinced of it, but we'll go with there's 12 sides on this one. So I'm not going to, I'm going to skip over this. I wasn't sure how long I would talk or not talk and how many questions you would have. So I'll show you. Oh, this one I got to show you. My wife thinks this looks like a, a snap. And a clothing. Somebody else thought it looked like a tire rim, like a you know a nice aluminum wheel. So this journey has been crazy. Do you like um? You, you, you like orange? I'm not a fan, but but a lot of people on my Instagram, if any of you use Instagram, loved it. <laughs> So it's been kind of crazy, something to do all winter. So, you know, I do this because it's my hobby. I probably haven't made a dollar as a snowflake photographer. So yeah, I'm glad it's not my advocate, you know, my vocation, it's my avocation. But some, it's been really fun to share my work with people like yourselves and then what comes from that sharing. And uh, so this was an uh, Instagram company called Mashable featured me last, whoops. See if we can get it to run and, and play all of it. Yeah, but it's hard to coordinate. I can't schedule anything. Well, you, you get the idea. And then uh, Time featured me. They found me on Instagram as well. So I've been hashtagging my photographs since 2010. Real snowflakes and people started to follow my accounts and schools all in the Rochester area invite me this kind of season to talk about the snowflakes and the children's books. And I get these really fun little cards. You saw the first one I shared with you. So I look forward to that. So this is, if any of you use social media, you can follow me. I welcome all of you to, to watch my work. It's seasonal as you can imagine. Um, Rochester Television has come out and done a little story on me because they also, uh, what do you do in the winter? You know, people ski, people snowshoe. I uh, wrote two children's books. So this one, yeah, this one is, yeah, I brought some if anybody has grandkids or kids, kids they'd like to. Because it's so random that it's such a small space it's an inch by an inch and three inches and so it's really it could happen and if the humidity is too high moving them is impossible i can't put a static charge if there's a ton of so i do both i have the crystals in the tray on glass and then i catch them in the velvet and if i can't move them uh, i don't this is the second book we just published last year this is an activity book rather than a story about my nut <laughs> being a, a little bit of a nut job uh, and then I get notes from the kids in different school districts, which has also been very touching. So it's Michael's H-O-W-S, <laughs> his hoss, <laughs> and I'm the character. <laughs> so I think Caitlin Six. Uh, I had an exhibition at the Science Center in Rochester. They found out about my work and they had an empty room one winter. And so we, we converted the room and I reached out to the Buffalo Museum and Science Center and uh, we brought a microscope to the and we got these artifacts from the bentley collection loaned to the rochester museum for the exhibition so this was great fun kids it was interactive so i could push the button and ted kinsman my friend makes snowflake molds he creates a resin and catches the mold, snowflake in the mold and then it evaporates and it leaves the shell of the mold and so we had the mold in the exhibition so that the kids that were there could focus the microscope and push the light to see it. So it was it was great fun. The Rochester newspaper also is interested in my work. So it's it's been crazy. Just been nuts that you know snowflakes would be of interest to all of these folks. So this is the thing I'll end with. So photography is not new. We all have our smartphones in our 
in our purses and our pockets now, but photography was invented in the 1840s, 1839, and people had to make their own film. And they had to make the emulsion on a piece of glass, and then they'd run out when the emulsion was wet, and they'd photograph, and then they'd develop it. If it dried, it didn't work, so it had to stay wet. It's called wet plate collodion photography. And this guy here, Willie, is somebody I teach with. He's a wet plate collodion photographer at RIT. I said, Willie, I have never seen a wet plate collodion snowflake. We have to make a wet plate collodion snowflake. Now, he lives in Canandaigua, which is about 45 minutes from Rochester. So, you know, coordinating his schedule, my schedule, snowfall, <laughs> him making the emulsion. But we said we had to try it. So we watched the forecast. We watched the forecast. And so you can tell I'm in my laundry room at the house it looks like a lot of laundry rooms and he brought his supplies and so he's going to make his own emulsion on a glass plate and we're going to run outside together and this was our test because we had no idea what exposure time to use like there's no way to measure light when you use a the material is so slow it could take a, a minute to get an exposure so if you ever see old pictures, people were moving because they couldn't stay still for a solid minute. So we made our test exposure and here's the development on the test. So we know that the, if there's the little target that we used as a snowflake crystal target on glass. This was a 45 second exposure to make this picture. So there it is, that's a wet plate collodion target picture. So we decided when we were ready, it was snowing. It was 30 degrees, so fingers crossed that the crystals wouldn't melt. And we had to work super fast. But you're going to watch that what we hope was probably the world's first wet plate collodion snowflake. So you'll see it just like we did. Show up. 1815 all over again <laughs> so we did three we were able to make three and now they're in the rit archive so thank you for your attention i hope you enjoyed my little wandering conversation about my obsession and the, thanks for your interest in being here on this wonderful crazy weather day Are there any questions from, is there any questions on Zoom? Yes, you have any? I can, oh, sorry. Please, go ahead. Uh, I was thinking about the three-dimensionalities there, and you saw the, you mentioned the kind of weird one. Um, I wonder if there's, I think, I would think MRI kind of yep. imagery. Yeah, you can't take that magnet outside. No, no, I don't think so. Can't bring that crystal inside. Is there a way to have you tried turning 90 degrees and uh, I don't know how you fix it? Well, there's a way to make many pictures and make a stack of them, photograph, 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 photograph. Okay. And then there's software that can build a new derivative picture from those slices. I haven't had much luck with it and I kind of like the flaws in them personally I mentioned that earlier because for me they feel like okay they're they're real you know there's a focal point to the pictures there's others who love to make their pictures perfect everything focused edge to edge and so everybody has their sort of aesthetic the, the few of us that do this kind of work so I've tried to make these uh, increased depth of field pictures but I don't know there's technical issues with the software. Sometimes it doesn't line up the parts of the slices just right. And it, it's called ghosting, where you see a little random part of the crystal shows up in the wrong place. So I, I shied away from it. I work quickly and I get what I get and move on. But thank you for the question. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. So a couple of times you referenced um, how this is like a crazy hobby of yours. And I can appreciate that. Um, at the same time, I think one of the wonderful things about what you do is that it, it seems like you experience so much frustration, but then you have these moments of like brilliance and beauty where it probably makes all of what you do as much worth it. My question is, how long did it take you the first time you went out and you saw your first photograph? How long did it take you before you were actually able to capture that image? 
Well, it's the technology of digital cameras has in, improved dramatically in 20 years. So the earliest cameras I was using helped immensely because, you know, the number of pixels in my files and the kind of contrast and the dynamic range of the sensors has improved so much that I can immediately see the quality of the just the pixel in the files have improved over the time. I think it was probably four or five years before I started to feel like I got good sharpness because, um, you know, focusing is very difficult. Like we all have blood pressure, thank God. <laughs> so our retina is doing this, boom, boom, boom. You know, every time your heart beats, your retina moves a little bit. And I'm focusing and I'm breathing. And so getting my focus is difficult because the snowflake is melting or evaporating. So these kind of things are forces. So I have to, I've taught myself how to see better. I've taught myself how to light better. Uh, in the beginning of the season, I'm not very sharp. It's kind of like I still have the training wheels on. I got to remember what I did last February and last March that I really liked and then rediscover that. And then by December, I'm into that groove a little bit. If it's snowing this December, I didn't photograph, but one time, sometimes I can photograph a lot in December. This year was six or seven degrees warmer. And I think we only had a total of five inches of snow. Um, so I photographed a lot in January. Uh, and then, you know, then I'm in the groove and by now I'm ready to be done with winter. <laughs> I'm kind of over it. I'm kind of over it. And, you know, I have a love hate relationship with winter at this point in the year. So it's weird to be a snowflake photographer like that part of it, but not like winter so much. <laughs> so thank you for your question. And I'm still learning, you know, it's still, still challenges. There's still a lot of challenges, you know, like making more focus. I wish I could make more focus, but I don't want to submit to the increased depth of field imaging because I, I just don't like the way it looks necessarily. It's too perfect. It looks almost like a computer drawing to me, and I, I much prefer to see the objects uh, in the way that I saw them in my eye and the way the microscope perceived them. I can make it more perfect, but I choose not to. And, and that's, you know, for other people, so that's what's nice about photography. There's so many ways that people interpret the same thing. So for me, the small imperfections sort of legitimize the work. They don't make it bad. Others might disagree with me, and that's okay, too. We could have a good conversation, just like Bentley and Hellman. <laughs> they had an argument about his manipulation of the snowflakes. One thought it was good, helpful for the viewer, and the other thought he was breaching the rules of science photography. So, I mean, who's right? At the end of the day, who, who's right in that argument? Because we value Bentley's pictures now and Hellman's pictures as historical artifacts that are beautiful and collectible. People that own them will spend a lot of money to own that in their collection. But at the time of their making, those two scientists argued with each other about who was ethical and who was not. And they're doing it across the Atlantic Ocean, maybe by might take them six months to get the letter back and forth to each other, right? It wasn't like now I could, you know, I'm watching Gunther, he's here still. It's getting late in Germany, but you know, we to imagine trying to do work like this a hundred years ago. Must, you know, you really had to be obsessed. <laughs> I, I wouldn't even be in the ball game with those guys. <laughs> any other questions from any of you here? Yes. If you were photographing in like Colorado, yep. or one of those states that get snow that's drier, I would think there would be more dendritic crystals and less humidity and other kinds of topographical stuff, but that's just speculation. You don't know people who. Uh, I don't know any snowflake photographers in Colorado. I'm sure there are people, but you know, I, I don't know. I'm not aware of them. It, there's not a lot of us. You know, there's not a lot of people that at least that get to a certain level with it. Um, so I don't know. I'm sure there are people that play with it. I think people in Vermont would have the same experiences because the altitude in the mountains, because they're at the right latitude. If you go down to Tennessee, they don't get snow. They don't get snow in the Smoky Mountains. They don't get in the Appalachians in West Virginia. They don't get that kind of snow. So, you know, people in Colorado, a lot of those mountains are tall. The humidity is lower there. They get these massive snows and then it's sunny for two days, right? It's a whole different weather pattern. We get the Great Lake weather pattern, the lake effect, the high humidity that just hangs, that cloud cover just hangs here for six months. Like this is today for six months, right? <laughs> it shows up once the weather starts to change and it stays until, you know, the, the, the poles are close to, you know, maybe late April. I was just wondering, are there certain conditions that we can predict that we see 
more of the Yeah, lower temperatures. Lower temperatures, that seems to be sort of that key. So, you know, if the temperatures are going to be 15 to 20, you know, but I haven't seen many of the stellar plates this winter for some reason. I've seen, and, you know, the stuff that I didn't show you, it's, it's been far and few between good crystals. I had a lot of, a lot of rimey stuff and a lot of granular stuff and a lot of just nondescript snow, but the, the few times I've got, I had to work hard to look in my snowflake tray, almost like a snowflake archaeologist looking for some good crystal in all of the, the nonsense that was in the tray. But yeah, no, not too many plates this year. It's a, it's a colder temperature to make them where they're really clear. The temperatures of the lake. Well, probably. You know, I haven't been paying attention to it in that kind of way as much because. You know, I'm a photographer and I'm an administrator and a professor, so I'm, I'm working and this is something to relax and do until my fingers are numb. <laughs> I know when I'm done, when my fingers are numb and my, my boots or my feet are frozen and I've realized I'm frozen and it's time to go back in the house. And then I take all the rest of the day to warm back up. Because if it's a good run, if I'm in a good run, if there's a good band of good crystals, I want, I got to stay with it because then they'll be gone. I wish I had photographed and, and the one that I didn't get. That's already the, always the reason I keep coming out for the one I don't get. Hoping that the next January 2nd, 2014 crystal is going to fall. But it doesn't. I don't know. That's been a seven year wait for something that good again. So do you document if it's a January 2nd? Do you know what the temperature was? Sometimes. Uh, on my Instagram, I put the temperature there. And so I'm not kind of that obsessed about it. I put the dates on all my photographs and the metadata from the storm is in the photograph. Sometimes I put how much snow fell in the Instagram posts, but no, I only remember those two dates because those two crystals were so special. The others are kind of like just, I know it was winter of 2018 or, or I could guess it might've been January or February, but those two crystals were so unique. Uh, I remember those dates because they get asked for sometimes for talks. Or... Well, thank you for braving the, the weather. It's, we had a little bit of a storm in the middle of the talk. I did bring some the books if anybody was interested. I asked Kristen first if I could hawk books, and she said, yeah, but I, that's, I didn't want to assume anything. Thanks for being with me. It's very nice to meet you all. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>